Please stand with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before you hungry and thirsty for your presence, for your love. Bless us, we pray, this morning with your Holy Spirit, that it would move in our hearts, transform us into the image of your Son, that we may offer a sacrifice of praise that is acceptable to you. We ask this through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, hymn number 45, Open Now Thy Gates of Beauty.
Thank you, John, for that. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It's good to see all of you. Uh, well, yeah, we're doing well today, right? We're doing well. Uh, just before we begin, uh, continue with our worship, I just wanted to make a couple of quick announcements. Um, one is that beginning September 8th, this is a reminder and an invitation to all of you, that beginning September 8th, our Praxis service, which has been our service that we hold in the chapel, will be moving to Friday nights. So you all have the opportunity to come out. So I invite you especially, if you're just going to come and try out, let's, let's fill the chapel at least that first night, okay? September 8th, let's all be there. And then if you like it, you can come back next week, okay? Just give me one week, right? Okay. September 8th, we'll see you Friday night in the chapel. September 6th, just two nights before that, uh, we'd like you to be here for that as well. Uh, we're launching two programs at the same time. So September 8th, Praxis moves to Friday night. September 6th, we're starting a new special program that we're calling Koinonia. Now, Koinonia is a Greek term. You'll be hearing me talk more about it. You've heard me talk about this in the past. Koinonia means fellowship, uh, sharing, participation, togetherness, community, communion, all, all of those things that are most important. That's what the word Koinonia means. So on Wednesday nights, every Wednesday night going forward, beginning September 6th, we're going to be meeting together. Uh, all together, we'll start in the chapel uh, for some worship and a quick little discussion, and then we'll break off into groups. And it's in those groups that our faith is really strengthened and empowered. It's through community. It's through sharing. This is wonderful, right? We enjoy this. But you notice that you're all just facing one way. This is all just a one directional thing, me talking to you. So Wednesday nights is our opportunity for togetherness, for sharing. So we're really looking forward to all of you coming out and supporting this. This is here to support you. So with that in mind, uh, we wanted to invite a couple of people out this morning who have been a part of our small group ministry from the beginning. And just to share a little bit of a testimony about the strength and the impact and the power of living the spiritual life in community. So Janet and Pearlie, why don't you come on forward and share with everyone your, what your experience has been. Okay, I guess I'm she, going first. Um, when I was told that I was going to do this, I, I said, how long do I have? And they said, one in to one and a half minutes, I said, oh, okay, I better write it down because I tend to talk too much. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I thought I'd ask myself a question. Why am I a small group member? Um, I tend to be fairly independent. I'm not unfriendly, maybe, but, but independent. So that's not my usual. I don't belong in a clique or a whatever. But, um, but I had been in a group previously. It was mostly prayer and fellowship, and um, I'd been in it for eight years, and all of us that stuck with it loved it, okay? We didn't want to miss anything. And so I thought, hmm, this might be nice if I can find one where I fit. So part of that is finding one where you fit. But the group I'm in right now anyone fits. Okay, you can be whoever, whatever, doesn't matter. Why did I join? I wanted some people to study and pray with. I study and pray on my own, not bragging, just do. I'm not one of the three hour or four hour Teresa type, but I do try to keep going. As a teacher, there's few places you can squeeze stuff like that in. But um, I've noticed that if I have someone else, I'm more accountable. I, if I know that we're going to be studying a certain chapter, I make sure I know that chapter very well. I try to go over it enough times so I'm sensible about it. Um, and what I also love is that there are people who you can discuss things with. Um, I can put my thoughts out there without people going, Whoosh, you know. And they can do the same, and we're all, hey, okay. And we listen, and we discuss. I, I thrive on that. It's not just me alone, right? Um, it, I think the other thing, too, and I, I can't explain this, prayer 
Prayer is good by yourself. Prayer is your, your heart and soul. There's no way you can, at least me, I can't get by without it. But prayer with other people makes such an amazing difference. And if you, I don't know that I can say, okay, if you have two, it's better than one. Well, we say, it says that in the Bible, doesn't it? It doesn't say it's better, it just says God is there if there's two. Um, but the other thing is that things do happen, okay? I can't explain it. I can't give you any theology about that. No, no, no. But I do know that when we pray about things in our group, stuff happens. Amazing things happen. Sometimes it takes a few years. But we all are excited when, when things happen, when prayers get answered. Do my own prayers get answered? Sure. But not this, it's not the same. How can I say that? I don't know. The other powerful thing is to have people pray for you in front of you. Again, I can't explain that. But I know the first time that someone prayed for me in front of me, and it wasn't in a small group, it actually was just the two of us, it was mind-boggling. Not because the person prayed what they thought, but I know that they prayed what the Holy Spirit put on their heart. Does that make sense? Because I didn't tell them I needed prayer, they just, hey, could I pray for you? And I was like, okay, sure. And then they had all this stuff come out and I'm like, but you don't know me that well, how could you do that? Oh, okay, <laughs> look in the wrong direction. Um, just being friends with the members of a small group is really, fun. They're, because it's an inclusive group and it's very diverse, you don't necessarily know these, even their, their thoughts, right? They're all different, everyone's unique. Um, the fun part about that is you, you get to know people pretty well, what they pray about, what they care about, who they want to pray about. That tells you a lot about people. Um, I pray for you. I pray that you will find a small group, something that fits you, someplace where you're comfortable, people that will keep your personal information quiet. I know that if we pray in the group and we put something in prayer there, we, it pretty much stays there. So we can be, you know, <laughs> we can have some people that pray about really important things to us without thinking that it's going to be out there. Um, I want you to find a group that fits you a T to you to a T, that makes you feel happy, that the people love you. You can't help it. You know, if you pray together and you study together, God puts that love in your heart. It's already there. There's nothing you didn't do anything about it. It just came from Him. Um, so it's it's a really good experience, and it's a very good spiritual experience. It will help you be stronger when you're trust is getting a little eh, you've got other people to help, hey, you know, you've, you've, your trust is okay, come on, hang in there. You know, you've got people to do that for you. So think about it. It's, I highly recommend it. And um, I hope you grow spiritually from the experience. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Matthew 18, 20. Good morning. My name is Pearly Evanado. I am here to share the benefits and the blessings I have experienced in belonging a Bible study group. I have asked my friends that I meet on Monday nights the impact and the importance of our Bible study in their personal lives. Let me read them to you. I like that we always try to articulate a take Takeaway point that stays with me during the week ahead. I like that doing my homework provides focus for my personal study time. I like the connection and sense of community we have amongst us. I like that we can open and honest and ask, answer our own questions together. I have more eagerness to study and share insights knowing that I have a group to share this with and it makes me feel even more vigilant or aware or where and how the Holy Spirit leads me and the group study as well as its uh, supplication, implication in our daily lives. As a returning member, I, have, I love the sincerity, depth, and complexity 
without us realizing it that it makes me appreciate this small group. Applying what I learned to my life is gold. I love the way our thoughts flow freely without any hesitations. It feels safe and personally, I feel loved as well. I get to see how scriptures applies in our lives today even though these stories happened a long time ago. It is a safe place to express our concerns of life as well knowing we all care and pray for one another. Everyone's vision and experience is something I look forward and enjoy hearing. It helped me in my spiritual growth. If you have noticed, each one of these testimonies are expressed differently, yet with a common theme of spiritual growth and a sense of belonging. Since we all have become close friends while seeking Christ and claiming His promises through His Word, at the back of the bulletin, under Group and Events, is a list of groups that meet up on different days of the week. I urge and encourage each one of you to plug into one of these groups and be blessed by it. It is a great way to know better member of our church family while becoming enriched and being empowered with God's word during the weekday. If you do not belong to one of these groups yet, you are missing out on the tremendous blessings in being a part of it. Please take part and be reminded by his faithfulness and his love to us. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. As I look around the room this morning, I would guess that most everyone in this room has been affected and impacted either directly or indirectly by Andrews University, Loma Linda University, Oakwood University. Most of us have some kind of connection to those schools and, uh, and have benefited from that connection. It's our joy and privilege this morning uh, to help support these institutions in the ministry that they do and also to help support the, the Seventh-day Adventist world budget. Will the deacons please come forward to receive the offering?
Dear Lord, we thank you indeed for the many blessings that you give us every single day, and we ask your blessing upon this offering as it goes to help uh, academic institutions and the world budget to further your cause and to spread your love around the world. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing. And this is your opportunity to greet one another, find someone that you know, find someone that you don't know, give them a hug and wish them happy Sabbath. And while that's happening, children, if you would come up to the front for your children's story. Good morning. Not a lot of kids, still everyone's still in vacation, but I have a great story for you guys today. There was a little girl named Tina. Tina was seven years old. And one great afternoon, Tina was playing in her backyard when all of a sudden she hears something. Ready? What is that? Tina gets up and she hears because she knows there is a third one coming in. Yes! That was the sound of a big ship. Her father was the captain of a huge ship. And when she heard that sound, she ran because she knew she was going on the trip with her father. And she hurried, she grabbed her luggage, and she hurried to the big ship that was about to leave. She gets there, she jumps on board, and everyone gets in, and the ship takes off. She's so excited because she knows everywhere on that ship. She goes up and down the stairs. She goes where the engine is. She goes where the captain is. She goes where the where, where the where, where all the the workers are and she knows every corner of that ship and the most of all the, her favorite part spot is where the captain is way above where the captain sees everything he sees the sea way ahead he sees from the side to another side and he's making sure that the that big ship is going in the right direction and then tina got a little tired because she played so much and she said you know I'm gonna go to sleep and then she went to, to sleep in her room as she was in her sleep during the during that day or that night all of a sudden people to uh, uh, people in the ship they hear something and they hear that slowly there's a big storm coming and it's getting louder and that storm is hitting the ship and the ship is rocking back and forth and the captain is up there looking to make sure where he's going to take that ship and make sure that they're not going to sink everyone start running back and forth oh save yourselves save yourselves look at the big storm what's going to happen with the ship and while everything's happening she was at sleep on the bottom of that ship People came back and they knocked on the door. The door was, was locked and they opened. They saw that Tina was asleep and they said, Hey, little girl, wake up. There's a big storm outside. We're all going to sink. Come on. We, we got to get to the, to the safety boats. And while everyone is running back and forth, you are asleep. You got to be kidding me. We're trying to save our lives and you're at your deep sleep. Why? And she said, oh, don't worry, we'll be fine. What do you mean we'll be fine? Look at the, look at the big storm. No, we'll be okay. How, why are you so peaceful? Because my dad 
is the captain of the ship. And I know that he's not going to let anything happen to any of us. See, they didn't know the captain. They didn't know that the captain was her father. But she knew that her father wasn't going to let anything happen to her during that storm. You know, we have a big father up in heaven watching over us. And we are in this big storm and sometimes we run around back and forth crazy thinking there were something bad is going to happen to us. But you know what we need to do? We need to just rest assured that our fathers in heaven is the captain of this big ship and he's not going to let anything happen to you, to me, mom or dad. Would you never forget that for me, please? Yes. Who's the big captain? God is. Thank you so much for, for listening to the story. You may go back to your seats now. There's no children's story. And while well, mom and dad listen to their part of the service now.
blessing came through raindrops? And what if your healing came through tears? And what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes until you're here? What if my greatest disappointments or the achings of this life are the revealing of What an opportunity we have when we can talk to our Creator, our Lord, our Savior, our Father, our Redeemer, our friend. As the pianist plays hymn number 671, let's contemplate and prepare our hearts as we pray this morning. Let's sing together hymn number 671 as we come to you in prayer. Our Father and our God, Lord, we praise your name for who you are. You are our Savior, our Redeemer, our best friend, our lover, our Creator. And so, Lord, we've come to worship you today. Thank you so much for everything that you've given us and that you've done for us. Lord, we know that when we have trials, that when we have difficult times, that you're there with us. When we have a difficult decision to make, you're there to guide us. When we make mistakes, you utterly forgive us. So, Lord, as we come to you today, we beseech you, we give you our, our problems, our thoughts, knowing that you are the problem fixer. And ultimately, Lord, we're convinced and we know that you never make mistakes. And so thank you for the grace that you have bestowed on this church. And we pray a special prayer for all of our church family. You know the needs that we have. You know the desires of our heart. Lord, you even know the anxieties that we face this morning. But by your Holy Spirit, we ask that you help us to let them go and give them to you. Please be with Pastor Shane as he speaks to us today. Lord, send him an extra power of your Holy Spirit to, so that when he speaks, we can hear you. Thank you again for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
you stand right here? Come over here, my daddy. There you go. Okay. We'll be reading from Matthew 14, 22 to 33 this morning. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Good morning. How are you guys? Oh, not well, I guess. Okay, all right. That's okay. Uh, no, I thank you for the scripture reading. I, I, I think we should have them do it every week. That's, uh, that's, that's the best one I've heard in a long time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so today's gospel reading, as you just heard, is a story that we know well. Um, it's a story that we've heard since we were children. And I think there's a couple reasons why it makes for a good children's story. One is that when you're speaking with children, you have to compete against all sorts of things that grab their imagination. So it's nice to have a story that has this kind of super-powered twist to it, right? It's an, it's an exciting story, it can be. But perhaps even more importantly, it's an appropriate story for children because the message, the lesson of the story, is very simple for anyone to understand. The disciples are out on the sea, and the waters are troubled, but even there in the midst of the storm, Jesus is there with them, right? Jesus comes to them. Jesus is present to them. Very simple message. Jesus will come to our help. But if the point of the story is the presence of Jesus in the midst of storms, then isn't it interesting how the story begins? Pay attention again. He says, the gospel says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. It's not as if the disciples have wandered away. It's not as if they got into this storm because they were somehow disobedient. Jesus sends them away, and Jesus sends the crowds away so that he can be alone. So, something is going on here, right? For a little bit of context, I think it's interesting to note Maybe sometimes we've heard this story a million times, but have not paid attention to the chronology of events in Matthew's Gospel. In Matthew's Gospel, so much has happened in this very day. Earlier this morning, Jesus first received word that John the Baptist had been killed. And when he gets this message, Matthew says that he seeks to go away by himself. So he gets in the boat by himself. And he goes to find a deserted place. And when he comes ashore, there the crowds have already gathered, thousands of people. 
So here he is looking for solitude, looking for time and space to grieve his loss. But when he comes ashore, when he comes to his place that he thought would be his private place, thousands of people are there waiting for him. So, naturally, he spends the day healing them, taking care of them. And by the time evening comes, the disciples have now caught back up to him. And he sees them there, Jesus with the crowds. And this is where Jesus tells them, ah, it's evening now. So he spent the whole day with these people. And he says, it's evening now. Before they go, uh, you should feed them. And of course, you know the story. They say, how can we feed them? We only have five loaves and two fish. And so he feeds the multitude. And it's right after he feeds the multitude that this is when our story picks up. So now, again, it makes sense why Jesus says, okay, now the day is finally over. You guys go on ahead. I'll send the crowds away. I am finally going to be alone. So this story, which on the surface seems as if it is a story about God's enduring presence, is just as much a story of absence. Jesus experiences inner turmoil of grief and loss and pain, and so he sends the disciples away, not just so that he can be alone, but he sends them away into troubled waters. Jesus knows what they will encounter out there. The story, gospel, the, Matthew's gospel, as he narrates this, seems to indicate that the wind was blowing strong from the very beginning. So Jesus knows that he's sending them out into rough waters. But just as he must endure his own experience of suffering, he sends the disciples out to experience trouble of their own. And here I think we have lost sight of something so important. One of the major themes of Scripture that we see throughout, especially in the Old Testament, but I think we see it really in the book of Job, perhaps summarized best. This theme that I'm talking about is that God does not promise or give us any reason to expect that life will be easy. And so we have gotten it into our minds that everything good is from God, which is true, the Bible says that, but that anything that happens that we don't like must be contrary to what God wants. But that is not at all the case. Think again of the words of Job. He says, after losing everything and everyone in his life, what's his response? Right there in Job chapter 1. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And what's most interesting is that Scripture adds, in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with any wrongdoing. You see, for Job to say, the Lord has taken away from me my children. The Lord has taken away from me everything that I had. The Bible says in saying this, he was not charging God with any wrongdoing. You see, by acknowledging the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, he's not calling God evil. He's acknowledging the wisdom of God. He's submitting himself to the will of God. Consider, for instance, maybe a, 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 an example that might make this point a little bit clearer. Think of Paul, what he tells the Corinthians about this so-called thorn in the flesh. Now, we don't know exactly what Paul's thorn in the flesh was, but he's, he has something that causes him pain, perhaps physical pain or, or something spiritual, something emotional. But this is what he says to the Corinthians. He says, therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, he calls it, sent to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, 
But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. You see, it's a mark of spiritual immaturity when we think that whenever we encounter misfortune or pain or loss, that it is contrary to the will of God. To be spiritually mature, as Paul is, is to recognize that God, in his wisdom, sends us into storms. And sometimes, like in our story this morning, he sends us there alone. So the story continues. By this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came, walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Now, you have to see the irony in this situation. That the predicament of the disciples has just gone from bad to worse. They've already been sailing all through the night on rough waters, and now it seems as if they're being haunted by some spirit from the underworld. And I think that in this, there's an important lesson in this situation, that the disciples have been sent out alone into stormy weather, and when the Lord does arrive, they don't recognize him. What the disciples think they see here is not entirely clear. It says in Greek, what they're calling this thing is a, a phantasm, a phantasm, an apparition. So perhaps they think that this is uh, the spirit uh, of some dead sailor, uh, perhaps someone who has himself drowned in these waters. Perhaps they think they're seeing uh, a sign of their own impending doom, right? Or perhaps they think they're seeing some kind of demon. Maybe they think that now here they are separated from their Lord, that the devil is seizing the opportunity to come and destroy them. But think about this, and I don't know what this will mean for you in your life, but I want you to think about this. We have to wonder whether or not in our own lives that when God appears to us, we might have mistaken it for something evil. The question we must ask ourselves is whether or not we will have the patience, the wisdom, the spiritual insight to see the presence of God in our fears and in our pains. So again, let's return to the words of the Apostle Paul, who three times he asked that this angel of Satan would be taken away from him. But in the end, he was able to see that this angel of Satan was actually from God. This thing that he says that was sent to torment him was a gift. That God gave him this pain for his own sake, to keep him humble, to keep him faithful. I mean, this is the mark of a real saint, a real spiritual giant that Paul can look at his own pain and say, God gave this to me to keep me from being too elated, to keep me from being too easygoing, to keep me from being too full of myself. God gave me this pain to remind me of my weakness and to keep me dependent on him. James writes something similar to us. He says, Whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. So as the disciples cry in fear at the appearance of this demon, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. But 
Peter is not yet convinced that this ghost is who he says he is. So Peter answered him, saying, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water, and he came toward Jesus. Now, this imagery of walking on water is interesting because it has so much potential meaning. Talk about walking on water, but think, for instance, in the Old Testament, of the times in which God separates the waters and allows his people to walk through on dry land. Think of Moses splitting the Red Sea for the Israelites. Later, Elijah will split the Jordan River, allowing himself and Elisha to walk through. And this is interesting, I think, when we consider the fact that in Scripture, water is often something that represents chaos and turmoil. Think, for instance, of Genesis chapter 1. The world before God begins the creation is described as this deep and tumultuous ocean, this primordial chaos. You see, the sea for people like the Israelites was always a kind of symbol of the unknown, of something treacherous, of something dangerous. So when God parts the waters and allows us to walk through on dry land, what does that mean but that it is that God gives us an escape from the trouble and suffering is kept away from us? Yet when Christ stands on the sea, the wind still blows. The storm still rages. Christ does not take the disciples out of the waters. He does not yet calm the storm. On the contrary, he quite literally rises above it, and he invites Peter to do the same. So we may prefer that God split the waters for us, you get my meaning? We may prefer that troubles be taken away and pulled to the side that we can walk through on dry land. We may even pray as Paul did three times that God would take our troubles away from us. But just as Christ is greater than Moses and Elijah, so it is better to walk across stormy waters than to have the waters parted for us. And when Peter noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And you see, here's the key to the whole story. Here's the punchline, the moral, the lesson of the story. Peter is able to walk on water. He's able to rise above the storm because he has faith. But as he begins to doubt, he begins to sink. Now, this is not some generic platitude of, you know, if you believe it, you can achieve it, that kind of thing. It's not the lesson of this story. Faith is not a superpower. What faith provides in this circumstance is not that the winds die down or that the water recedes. Faith does not change our circumstances. What faith changes is our perspective. So you in your life today, as you encounter hardships of life, illness, grief, anxiety, loneliness, whatever it may be, I challenge you to pray over these things. Take them to God in prayer, and as scripture says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Pray, if you must, as Paul did, that God might take these hardships away from you. But I challenge you this morning to come to the maturity that St. Paul reached when he learned to see God's strength in his own weakness. Learn to pray the words of our Lord, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, 
but yours be done. Because faith does not always change our circumstances, but faith can change our perspective. Paul's thorn in the flesh was not there because he lacked faith. Do you understand that? Paul's suffering was not there because he was somehow spiritually weak. On the contrary, it was a sign of his strength in Christ. And it was faith that gave him the ability to see it as the gift that it was. Yet how often are we like the crowds who taunt Jesus on the cross, saying, take yourself down from the cross. You've saved others, but you can't save yourself. See, did Jesus hang on the cross because he wasn't spiritually strong enough to come down from it? That he didn't have enough faith to ask God to rescue him, right? That's not at all what's happening. And it's the immaturity of the crowds that say, ah, here's a man on a cross. If he is such a man of God, why doesn't he come down? And so we, in our own lives, and our own circumstances, have to come to the same realization that we can't blame others' lack of faith for their suffering. And when we experience suffering, the question is not, oh, what have I done to deserve this? But what is God teaching me through this? If we have faith, then instead of fixating on the wind and the waves, instead of keeping our eyes on our problems and always asking God to take our troubles away, let us instead keep our eyes on Jesus. Now again, to keep your eyes on Jesus may sound to many of you like a very sort of pious platitude, right? What does it mean to keep our eyes on Jesus, it means that we don't fixate on our problems. We don't obsess over what we wish was different, but we make our one and only priority in life to bring glory to God. That's the one thing we desire. The one thing that we keep our eyes on is Him. So that our prayer, in, in whatever circumstances you face, let your prayer be that God would be glorified. Not that you get what you want. Not that you get what even what you think is best for everyone. But that God would be glorified. Whenever I prepare for a message, that's my one and only prayer as I prepare. Not that it would go well, whatever that might mean. Not that you might receive a blessing, whatever that might mean. Not that I would be free from anxiety. Because whatever might happen here, as long as it glorifies God, that's all that matters. And if me getting up here and making a fool of myself and stumbling over every word, if that's what God needs to allow to happen, to keep me humble, or for God to be glorified, then so be it. So you, in your circumstance, whatever you face, let that be your prayer. Not that you get what you want, but that God would be glorified. That's what it means to keep your eyes on him. And with a faith like this, when God sends us into troubled waters, and even when the presence of God seems to us like a demon, if we have faith, we can make it through the storm, not around the storm, but through it. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. Go with us from this place with a sense of courage, with a sense of endurance. God, we pray for spiritual maturity, spiritual insight. Open our eyes to see the world as you see it, to see our pain as you see it. We thank you, Lord, for everything you give and for everything that you take away. And we ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I invite you to stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, one of my favorites.
O God, our help, hymn number 103. in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our guide while life shall last and our eternal home. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. 